is it going? Elliot, how are you? Sam, how are you? Gemma? Very well. <laughs> Not too bad. What's going on, guys? Half deck. Um, by the way, Gemma, nice background. I like the uh, very studious kind of like background change this time. So it made me look uh, intelligent if I show you my background. A little bit. I think so. For sure. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, we thought we would talk about some key reminders to keep yourself going on the recovery journey because I think... I think all of us need key reminders. Even when you're recovered, you just sometimes need some key reminders to keep you keep yourself going in life. Um, I know I have fallen into the trap of just being like, uh, oh, I don't know what my next goals are. What do I need to want? What do I want to go towards next in life? How do I even keep going? Is this it in life? <laughs> Is have I achieved everything I had to achieve? Kind of thing. So sometimes you have to also just like think of various ways of like, how do I keep myself? push like going forward and pushing myself um who would like to go first okay um i just wanted to touch on what you said about like how to keep yourself going and how to you know carry on even when you're feeling demotivated and you know bad um something i've been trying to do recently even though as i say i'm feeling so much better like i'm in a much much better place but I, I am aware that I will always have a bit of an OCD brain and, you know, I will, I will be susceptible to feeling certain ways sometimes. Um, and I will always have to deal with that. So what I've tried to do with like carrying on with things is when I'm like goal setting um, and it's not like a, I don't kind of sit down and, and write goals and things, but in my head, I have like certain goals that I want to achieve and, um, I used to kind of base my goals on my emotions. So I would, um, I would say like, oh, you know, I want to buy next year. I want to be feeling happier or I want to, you know, be able to feel excited about things. Or I, I would always base goal setting on emotions. Whereas now what I try and do is when I'm looking at like the future and goals that I have is I, I do like an action. So I, I I have a goal that I want to achieve this certain thing by this time, but I don't put any kind of emotion into that. I don't say I want to achieve this goal and I, I'm going to be really happy when I do that. I'm going to, I just think I'm going to achieve that. I need to do X, Y, Z to get to that. And if I feel like crap, I'm still going to go and do that because that's the goal that I've set in mind. So I think it's really important, like going forward with OCD to look at things without trying to back it up with emotions all the time because I think that's when you kind of fall into a bit of a trap of you know I want to feel like this I want to feel like that and you're you're trying to force it at that point um which as we know forcing emotion with OCD is never going to work it it will go the opposite way and that's such a big thing for fear of fear as well isn't it like we talk about a lot mm. the, the if you're basing on your if you're basing your progress or your goal hitting on how you feel then OCD is going to know that, isn't it? So mm. you're probably, you might achieve your goal and you still feel depressed. You still feel guilty. You still feel anxious. You're thinking, well, I'm not getting anywhere here. But like you say, if you're trying to achieve a goal and not watch the emotions or not, not, not care about how you feel, but don't put the utmost, um, the result, the outcome isn't based on how you feel, isn't it? Like, exactly what you were saying. It's whether you achieve yeah. the goal and see how you feel whilst you do that. Yeah, that's that's so true. I used to just base my recovery on like how I felt. I think that I I, I dispute my belief to try and change how I felt. And obviously, you're not going to be able to do that. You know, you've got to change your perspective on those feelings itself. But I remember Nick said in the chat about a week or two ago that if you're recovering to like change how you feel, then that OCD knows that and you're not going to change. It's about accepting the worst case scenario. And like, I think that's such a big thing. It's like, you know, when you're, when you're struggling with fear, fear, anxiety, you know, anything, you're not trying to get rid of stuff you're just trying to change your perspective on it and live alongside it and I think yeah that's that's such a big thing that you can like take forward in your recovery journey something that I've really found out that helped me essentially yeah because I see a lot of people what they do they, they'll dispute for mm. a real feeling so mm -hmm. they're only disputing a fear which is a, a good thing but then the reason they're doing it is wrong because they want to yeah. dispute and then the anxiety is gone then the chronic guilt's gone, the shame's gone. Well, that's not how it works because mm -hmm. all you're doing is writing stuff down on a paper to get rid of a feeling, and that ain't going to work. It's yeah. gradual perspective shifts. It's going to take time. It, it might take years. It might take 
two months that you, you don't know how long it's going to take. But if you mm. put in the work and not monitor how you feel, that's such a key part, isn't it? Because as soon as I started watching, I felt I, I felt like I got I felt stuck for ages because I was watching everything like, why ain't it gone yet? You know, I, I got a holiday next year. Why ain't it gone yet? I got Christmas coming up. Why ain't it gone yet? So you're so desperate for that rid of a feeling. So I think if yeah. you're just focused on the belief work and taking away, sort of separating how you feel and then just see, you just got to keep going and you never know, it might go with it, but you can't be just be solely focusing on, on the emotion side. Yeah, I was really guilty of um, only disputing in periods that I actually felt bad because I was just trying to get rid of a feeling. I wasn't actually disputing because I was looking at the long term goal of it and the long term. Mm -hmm. I'm going to change perspectives doing this. I was literally going, I'm in a really bad place. I'm going to start disputing the amount of times I must have said to Nick, oh, you know, I've got. I'm, I am feeling better, but I've got this little niggling. There's there's something there, and it's it's bothering me a bit. Should I start disputing again? And every time he was like, "No disputing for a month." I was like, "What?" <laughs> and but then the fact that I got so stressed when he said that meant that I shouldn't be disputing because the fact yeah. that I was upset that I wasn't allowed to dispute meant that I was yeah. just trying to do that to get rid of a feeling. That's yeah. so true. The more the more you need to recover, right? The more you need to feel a certain way, you're just not gonna you're not gonna recover, are you? Like mm -hmm. I've I found that to be so helpful. Like if you really yeah. need recovery, it's just gonna pull away. Like it's just not gonna happen. You don't need it like you think you do as well. And you can still have a good mm -hmm. life if you're not recovered, you know. Like even in even in the worst times, we like all of us, we've still managed to sort of live our lives and, you know, work and enjoy certain aspects. And you know, we, we don't need it like we think we do as well. I think that's a big aspect. Like you don't you don't really need obviously it's great if you do recover, there's a lot of benefits, but you don't you don't have to, you know. Yeah. And there's also yeah. a reason why people coast, isn't it? Because when you're stuck for so long, you get a glimpse of relief. So you then coast and then you only put in recovery work when you when you're in crisis again. Now that yeah. is like I was saying, you're only doing that to get rid of a feeling. So it's getting in that routine where you're consistently putting in recovery work, regardless of how you feel. It all relates to the emotion yeah. side of things again, doesn't it? And yeah. I like yeah. how Gemma also put it, like, I think um, where you're doing, like, whatever goal it is, or even if it's like a small task that you have to do, like, you're doing it without that aim of emotional result. Like, for example, if it's mm -hmm. um, like Gemma and me and Sam, we were just talking about uh, before this call, we were just talking about, you know, college experiences and things like that. So it's, for example, if it's like a college degree that you have to do, right? You're not doing it with, like not doing it with the aim of, specifically with the aim of that once I complete this, I will feel more confident or more happy in myself. Because that's a very quick easy subtle trap for OCD sufferers because then you are automatically attaching this big emotional expectation to whatever little task it is that you have to do or whatever little goal it is instead seeing like going to college or completing your degree as a logical thing that I mean this is something that for example is going to lead to maybe better job opportunities right or this is going to make me learn xyz thing um seeing it from that perspective and if you feel fulfilled and happy and you know uh like you feel like oh i'm more confident in myself as a result of that that's a bonus of course uh, that comes with it and that happens organically but if you're doing it with that sole aim of like i need to achieve that emotional thing is when you start to then chase specific feelings and force specific feelings and of course then that's where it feels like oh i'm not getting it so like, will I ever feel happy or will this ever uh, thing ever come to me? And my my biggest issue was also, Gemma, like yours, uh, basing literally small daily mundane tasks as well in how I was feeling, not seeing it as something logistically necessary or practically necessary, seeing it as, oh, is this going to get me the emotional outcome I want? But also on yeah. a side note, I forgot to wear this. I just got this like a couple of days ago. So I thought I'd... I noticed you run off and put that <laughs> yeah, on. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, why am I not wearing that? Why am I on with this like green sweater? Why is that hard? Yeah, I need I mean, well, um, text me later. I can, I, you can get them. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Um, and also, yeah. So, sorry. Carry on. Just on that as well. I mean, I find when you set a goal, it's 
it's not necessarily the end result is when you're going to feel the best because you usually just want something else. Like with a financial goal, you could set to earn a certain amount of money or to have a certain amount of money. But then usually when you reach that, you then want more. So I find the most yeah. enjoyable part of the That's journey part is the actual process, you know, actually trying to achieve it. And this yeah. is why you're not trying to just solely focus on how you feel because many parts when I set goals, it's the how I'm going to do it, you know, figuring it out, solving a problem for myself, that's the enjoyable thing I find, rather than hitting the result. Yes, that's that's satisfying, of course, but yeah. all the enjoyment, all the different emotions come through trying to achieve the goal and on that process. Yeah, definitely. I think it's like accepting the worst case scenario as well. Um, I, I, that, that was a big thing for me. Like I'd have, um, like, you know, trying to change my feelings, trying to change my internal state, and you know what's the worst case scenario? So you didn't achieve a goal. Like I remember, I was really obsessed with the gym and really obsessed with like um, not being fat. And I had this goal to like get really shredded. And you know, I I didn't actually get under the worst case scenario there. And I think a lot of people don't look at like what the worst case scenario is if they don't achieve something. So when you sort of look at what the worst case scenario is, you just sort of bring down the heat of that, and you're not really so obsessed with like I don't know. It might be achieving a goal. It might be recovering. It might be you know gym or work and you're not just so few to it because you think that like, oh, I absolutely must achieve this, but under any circumstance, you know, like you said, there could be to do with the gym or, you know, work or college and, you know, it's bringing down the worst case scenario as well. I think to say, you don't, you know what, even if I didn't achieve this goal, even if I don't feel this way, X, Y, Z, it's not, not the end of the world. Like, if you know what it's, I mean. It's, it's the same with like relationships as well, because mm. you don't come on and go, right, I'm only getting with you because I want to marry you. Right. It's the build up, isn't it? it the or when you invest all that time into the the relationship all that energy and is that enjoyment and then you might end up getting married you don't just set a goal going all right we're getting married it's so everything that comes with it it's the journey imagine, it's what we talk about it could be yeah, it's yeah. Work as well. like mm -hmm. imagine if there was like some i don't know like magical ai device or something like that where on your first date with someone you are able to immediately like uh, hash out your compatibility percentage and oh my God. Like, <laughs> yeah, right so whether you're able to get married or not that right? save some time wouldn't it? <laughs> it, it it would save some time but it would also suck out all the fun i would say because yeah. the fun is in going through the relationship figuring out do we want to be together or not like the suspense of it like if you know it immediately of course there might be like this gleeful reaction of oh yeah we are compatible but then I also feel like it would result in just like, okay, well, I already know. So, like, yeah, you know, what, you know. <laughs> what do you work towards then? It's like, could you imagine, imagine you knew when you were going to die, when you were going to die, how you were going to die. I think that'd be so boring because you'd be like, oh, no, here we go. Got to this day now. It's, you it's the unknown. About, yeah, yeah. You'll be sitting, waiting around for it, essentially. And yeah, which is why when is. people have a fear of death or fear of what will happen after death, for example, as well. I always say this, that uncertainty is actually like a blessing in disguise because mm -hmm. if you knew exactly, like think about like your favorite singer or artist was you're about to go to their concert. You have their ticket in your hand. You have like a, you know, you win like a, I don't know, coupon to have dinner with them or something like that. You literally be counting each and every single day to it because you know it's going to happen. It's like the same yeah. thing with even bad stuff. So if you know yeah. exactly when you're going to die or what's going to happen, then you're going to spend this entire life obsessing over that afterlife or when you'll die. You won't be like trying to be present. You won't be sitting with someone enjoying like a laugh or something like that because you'll be like, yeah, I'm I'm going to die in like uh, 500 days or something. I wouldn't want to know that now, but if you'd offered me the chance to know when I had health OCD, when I was going to die, I would have ripped your hand off. For <laughs> <it>. <laughs> yeah. Just if, I, if you'd have told me when I had health OCD that I was going to live guaranteed another two years and I was going to die exactly two years from now, most people being told they have two years to live would be like, that's terrible. I can't believe I've only got that much time. I would have honestly at that point gone, oh my God, I've got two more years. Because yeah. I thought I was dying imminently at all times. I always thought, you know, this is the last minute. This is the last second. So two more years would have been fantastic to me at that point, which now I think about it, that's crazy. Because if I was told now I've got two years to live, I'd be like, but then what? I'd only be... Yeah. I'd only be 31 I nearly said 21 then that was wishful <laughs> thinking um, I'd only be 31 that's crazy yeah but it's it, it is just your perspective is just so yeah. wild at the time isn't it exactly 
Because mm. you never know, one of us could have like a month to live, but only because we don't know. We we don't know that, do yeah. we? But if we were yeah. told that, well, think what would we do as well? Think about how, how you'd live your life. If someone went, you'd be dead next month. You'd probably do everything that you'd want to do now or certainly try yeah. and do that. I mean, and this is I'd, why be, I... I'd be sitting here being like, Sam, you know, it was such so nice knowing you. I want to cherish <laughs> all these moments with you. You're such a great person. Like, you're so this and that. You're so kind-hearted. Like, that's how it would go. It would basically be this extended drunk conversation of how much everybody loves you. Because everybody would know that yeah. like, you're about to die. Um, but and, and that's what also death does, you know, like it immediately shifts that perspective of how like yeah. then everything else fades away in a sense, like the little annoyances that you have with someone, it's just like that that had no meaning. Yeah, that's yeah. weighted, you know. And isn't it mad? Because as OCD sufferers, we're so scared of uncertainty. But and you turn it on its head, you can turn it into a really exciting point of life, can't you? Being uncertainty yeah. like like we keep saying, love you spoke about the whole time. If you if you knew when everything was going to happen, that would make life so dull. Like I'm going to football tomorrow. Can you imagine I knew the result. How dull would that be? The only reason <laughs> I go is because because anything can happen. Absolutely anything. Yeah. That's no, it. No. Like or I think anything. uncertainty is a luxury, and I know people who have a fear of uncertainty would be like, "What the hell are you talking about?" But uncertainty yeah. literally is a luxury. Like the um the presence it provides you the pressure that it lifts off you of not knowing what's going to happen um and also it it provides motivation as well Be because you don't know what's going to happen therefore you feel more compelled to put in a certain amount of effort and put your best foot forward to try to influence the results i'm not talking about like compulsively trying to control the situations in an ocd sense but generally like you know uh, whether you're about to get a job or not right you will work a little extra hard because you don't know what other people will think of you yeah definitely you're just more flexible like when when i find when you move through the recovery journey you're just better at handling uncertainty and just become a bit more flexible i'd say you're not you're not so rigid with things like if something happens it happens if it if it doesn't happen you know it doesn't happen and like you're just a bit more like loose if you like and I think that's such a good thing as you, as you move along the recovery journey you might sort of find that you're just a bit more flexible not just in terms of OCD but in terms of life as well like your your attitude towards stuff is is just more flexible like if, if something bad happens like I don't know you might I don't know lose your job or whatever you're just a bit like yeah it's happened but it's not the end of the world like i could maybe get another job or i can move on to something better like you just see stuff just more flexibly which is really good and it's just better oh, sorry overall just with the uncertainty it's just you know so much more better at handling it in a way i'd say I think <clears> and it's just like... goes... sorry you go, Jeff. You go. um i think also because there's not as much emotion behind these things when they happen so if something as you say like you lost your job or you know, any kind of big life event like that, that you're not expecting. I think because there's not such an emotional response anymore, once you've kind of gone through the OCD recovery journey, yeah. um, my mind, instead of going to, oh my God, that's terrible. That I feel like this about this. I feel this is, I don't start that initial awfulizing that I used to do ever now. I kind of, my brain goes straight into problem solving mode instead, because I've become more kind of, I, I'm I'm more thoughtful in the way that I think okay what can I practically do about this instead of I don't think of an emotional response I think of a practical response and when something happens my brain instead of going into awfulizing will automatically go okay so I've got this problem um I can do this to change it I can't do this I can do this I can't do this and it, it's almost like it becomes more of an equation rather than an actual emotional problem obviously if it was something severe like I found out a family member yeah. was dying or something I'm sure there would be more of an emotional response then even with not I'm definitely a job more practical well. than I used to be yeah even with not getting a job of course you will feel bummed out you'll be like man I really wanted mm -hmm. this this would have been like financially great it would have been great for my career great for my resume all those things so of course you you would be bummed out but it wouldn't be like a roller coaster of emotions like you can't even like handle it at all and I think what Sam was yeah. really saying about like um uh, we were discussing like finances like a little bit and i think like all four of us here for example all four of us would, would like to be a millionaire right if tomorrow we had an option of being a millionaire we'd be like yes please uh make us one but once right now in this position we think that once we'll be a millionaire we'll feel very comfortable no worries or like you know it'll be like okay i don't have to work as hard 
But once you're a millionaire, then you like after several months, you'll get used to being a millionaire. Then you'll be like, okay, how do I multiply this? How do I have more? So it will like exactly. every goal that you have in your mind. I mean, not saying that you don't achieve it. Yes, you achieve it. But also there will be more after that. The same as right now, while you're suffering really bad with OCD, your goal is working on recovery, for instance. Once you achieve recovery, recovery is not a full stop. Like I have my, there's no full stop on my life once I have lived, recovered from OCD. Like ongoingly, like there are challenges in life. There are things going on in life. So, and this is the other thing I really want to highlight with like key reminders for the recovery journey is to not see recovery as this end all be all full stop thing that you have to achieve and then, you know, everything will be set. No, like don't be a bit more realistic about it. Recovery takes care of one aspect of your life, which is the disorder part of life. But then ongoing things like, you know, you working on career, building a family, spending time with loved ones, uh, where you want to live, uh, what are your, what is your financial situation like, um, going through, I don't know, natural disasters, inflation, like there's so many things that are happening that happen on a daily basis around the world. Um, health related problems, death in the family, all those things will like keep happening in your life. So it's about also adopting a mindset of like being able to tackle any challenge that comes your way, whether you are recovered or not. Um, yeah. But especially after recovery, because recovery doesn't mean like everything becomes like rosy and butterflies and everything. Yeah. And I mean, just to elaborate on, on the point that both of you were making there, because the reality of life, like life can be pretty brutal life can be pretty shit shit happens in life so i find when you've been on the recovery journey you're so much more in touch with your emotions so you're not going from one swing to the other you're not going from one extreme where you're overly excited and the next minute you're on the floor depressed it's that being i say in control but it's, it's healthy emotions isn't it so yes if something really happens really sad happens a family member might die yes there's sadness there there's healthy sadness but you don't fall into that pit of depression where you feel like you, you can't get yourself out of it and that's because all what we've been through with the ocd journey all the different things the perspective shifts the gratitude shifts and like you say all the, all the different things natural disasters losing a job financial crisis so it helps with all parts of that so i think uh, the key point to remember is like Miriam said, it's not a finishing line. So you don't get to a point and where you're you're an emotionally numb robot and never get a, an emotion again because that's such a myth because that's just not what happens. I, I love being emotional, like, for example, at football matches or things that I love getting emotional at, uh, but it's all very controlled. I, I, I don't go to one extreme. Um, so, yeah, it, it's healthy, but you don't go to that unhealthy negative like anger, rage. Like when you're out driving, you see so many people road rage getting out of the car screaming and shouting but you Sam, think straight away you, right, Sam, I, I think you need to do a separate video on each and every football metaphor that fits into like <laughs> an explanation of what you need we could you do know? like a sam's <laughs> best we could do like a sam's best bits of all the uh football yeah That's exactly cool. i think so um and yeah. or elliot you can write the script for it you know um yeah. sam can do the voiceover and we can make a little animation out of you know a football match you and know, draw yeah. three parallels I'm, me, me I'm and sam to... go to a football game together to a bristol city game or a west ham game and i'll sit there and i'll write out everything that sam says or we just film it <laughs> with you and you like record your ongoing commentary on a football match <laughs> and being like see uh this is how the recovery journey is sometimes you do my <laughs> own goal and you know that happens but don't beat yourself up for it um, the, yeah. the reason the reason i use football is, as such an example because i'm sure elliot can relate to this as well you go from one extreme to the other at football and you really yeah. see how emotions can change like that yeah, so, yeah, for example, yeah. you're winning 1-0, and people who, who like football watching this video can relate to this. So, you're winning 1-0, and all of a sudden, you, you lose 2-1 in the last minute, and it might be a bad referee decision. So, from five minutes ago, you were ecstatic, on top of the world, loving life, and then five minutes later, you're dying, you're depressed, you're angry, you're shouting, mm -hmm. you're swearing. So, that's Lies the emotion. It. All your all your extreme irrational beliefs come out when, like, yeah. it, it's, the same, it's, with, it's the same with cricket, same with cricket. Yeah, <laughs> that's very much fault with that. 
<laughs> OCD wasn't but, awful, but losing at football is awful. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah. Like the ref, the but, referee shouldn't act in this way or like, you know. Gemma, Gemma, do you have it, any like, I don't know, sport or activity that like you can draw parallels with in your life? I don't watch any kind of sports. Um, the only sports I do is running. Um, but again, I don't, I, I don't watch that, so I don't get like passionate about watching a certain thing. Um, mm. No, I can't relate. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to, but I can't. There's, there's nothing that I get that kind of animated about. I don't yeah. think. It's also, it's also a good feeling as well because I, I never get too high, and that's not to say I never enjoy myself. Of course, but this is what we talk about. You don't get too low. So you can then yeah. get yourself angry, but then if you score a goal in the last minute, I love the emotion then, but then I can quickly get myself back down to quite a clear mind thinking rationally again. But I wouldn't ever want to take out the, the strong emotions, because strong emotions are great. It's the unhealthy negative emotions, or just any unhealthy emotions that get into trouble. They, um... yeah. Sorry, um, Albert Ellis talks about that a lot in the first book, um, which... If you're on this page, then hopefully you've you've read the first book. But if not, definitely do it because he talks so much about like the healthy versus ne- healthy versus unhealthy emotions in the sense that like sadness is a healthy emotion, depression's not. Um, a little bit of anxiety is obviously a healthy emotion because anxiety saves our lives. But obviously, you know, fear-inducing terrible anxiety at all time chronic anxiety I shouldn't have said terrible anxiety chronic anxiety (laughs) is not a healthy emotion so it kind of draws on the fact that we can still have all of these emotions because I used to think when I was disputing that I think I think you said it earlier moment that it was kind of going to make me a bit numb I thought you know once I become accepting of this kind of thing and I'm not going to have these extreme emotions anymore will that mean that I'm a bit numb and I kind of don't care about anything anymore? But it's not that at all. Like, I, I still get really happy. I still get really sad. But I just, it, it doesn't go to an extreme because I'm able to kind of rationalise things in a way that I never could before. Um, so, yeah, the first first uh, book on the reading list is really, really important for that. And like you say, anxiety and healthy panic is designed to save your life isn't it because imagine a bus or, or an object was coming your way you're not going to be like no nope, got no emotion and just really mm-hmm. slowly walk out of the way you need that panic to save your life to run out of the way of the bus to run out of the way of the brick that's going towards your head so it I keeps mean, your life was that a football imagine someone, <laughs> imagine someone is running towards you with a knife and you have no anxiety you're like oh well i mean i guess go ahead and do whatever uh, it is anxiety <laughs> that essentially saves our life for us to then take action and like i don't know defend ourselves duck out of the way whatever it is mm. yeah definitely um i'm really sorry guys i have to run i'm so 15 I actually, minutes late <laughs> i also it's fine um i also have to run but um oh, so make sure wrap this up anyway because i have a call to go to um but guys uh thanks for being here as always and i'll see you next week on another year thank you, Bye. See you guys. See you next week. Bye.